Cool, thank you everyone. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, which is uh, retention. Uh, and more importantly, I would say engagement. Uh, so maybe we'll just start as a, a quick, quick preface. Uh, I'll just use this cool jam board. I'm excited to use it on here. Um, so, you know, we've all launched mobile games and there's sort of kind of two states that you can kind of think of the world at, you know, if this is just sort of, you know, your revenue, oh God, um, revenue over time type thing. Um, so you, you see what you see, unfortunately see a lot of games, they, they sort of kind of launch like this where, you know, there's kind of a bit of a spike and then they kind of fall down and then the first game update kind of comes, a little spike and then they sort of, you know, tail off. Um, and then you see other games, you know, that are sort of, you know, the up, and, up and to the right. And, uh, you know, the difference between the two is kind of just a short-term um, retention problem. These games that we call shark finning, uh, you know, they're, they're sad, but it's really a game that just does not have short-term retention. Um, so when you launch a game like this, the real question is, what does your long-term retention look like? And that's the thing that we're, you know, we're going to try to figure out today. So if I just clear this here. So the interesting thing when you, when you think about long-term retention is, you know, what does that curve look like? Um, does your curve kind of do this and continue to grow? Does it sort of flatten out? Or does it sort of kind of die off at a certain point? And when you're trying to plan a business, from a business point of view, this is really important because unfortunately, you know, if, you, if it's the sort of the latter, you end up with this what we call kind of pie plating. So you end up launching a game and then it kind of makes money and then it kind of dies off. And then, you know, you hopefully, you launch another game in time so you sort of can kind of catch it again. And so you're in this sort of horrible sort of mode of where you're trying to continue to release product uh, just to kind of keep, you know, your revenue sort of flat. Which what you really want is something that looks like this where you launch one game and it grows and then the next game grows on top of it and you get this sort of stacking. And to do this, you really need to understand what long-term retention looks like. So I said most people sort of fall into this sort of uh, retention model where it's sort of cohorted based retention where you just sort of uh, everybody installs on D0. If you come back uh, on the next day after that, you're a D1 player and so on and so on. Um, and you kind of build like a graph of this and like said, really what does it look like? Because you, can, you can't really extrapolate these graphs very well. You don't know where it's gonna fall off. Is it gonna level off at some point? You know, what is a good number for day 365? You know, who knows, right? It's really hard to kind of extract long-term uh, retention out of this. So what most people end up doing is they sort of segment, right? So they fall into this kind of trap here where they sort of go, well, well customers are important, so we're gonna build like a customer base sort of funnel. So uh, you start off at the top where people install the game and then they might be a choir, they might have finished the tutorial. At some point they come back the next day and they become a player. Maybe they put money in the game and they give you, they're now a customer and they put more money in the game and you become a, a VIP and then, you know, there's some sort of a perfect customer that, that you're really looking for. The real problem about this is these are not uh, service metrics. These are retail metrics. So uh, it's very akin to, you know, old school AAA, right? You, uh, the player is the person that played the demo, the customer is the person that actually bought the game, and then your VIP is sort of the, your collector. He's the person who's got the collector edition, they got the DLC. Um, but mobile games are not this. You know, mobile games are a service, right? And service metrics are, are over time. So it's really a lot, I like using the bar example. So if I was running Cheers, you know, I was, my primary interest would not be uh, how many people bought a drink one night, right? It really is how many people come back every single day or every single time and, and continue your repeat customers or your regulars, right? So uh, we launched Contest of Champions uh, back in 2014 and it's been, uh, you know, our strongest game ever. It's gotten phenomenal uh, retention. And what we started looking at was we tried to sort of break that down and figure out why this retention was so good. So the first thing we did is we sort of broke it up by how many uh, metrics sort of broken out by number of days of the week that people play. And what we found is, um, the people that play seven days a week look nothing like everyone else. So just in the amount of engagement, the number of battles people play a day uh, from a seven day player is about two to three times more than a six day player. In fact, the six day player looks a lot more like the five day player than it does a seven day player. 
Um, and this also works for monetization too as well. If you, if you sort of normalize it off the one day a week players, you'll see that the seven day a week players spend you know, almost five times more than your one week a week player. So we said, I think we're onto something here. So what we ended up doing is we sort of looked at lapse rate. So um, here's four different games that we did. They're all different genres. Uh, they're all different levels of success. And we said, you know, what is the chance that someone is going to churn the next week after playing all seven days? And what you realize is basically zero. Um, I think on Marvel it's like 0.3%. So it's, it, uh, it's really, really stable. And it looks the exact same for all these games. They all look very, very similar. It's basically what we call physics uh, for retention. So that gave this concept of regulars. So we say uh, a regular Kabam is somebody who's played uh, seven days consecutive. And then that's on a daily, and then on a monthly, it's 90% of the month. So 28 days out of 31. And so in the regular base model, it's, it's much different. And you can look at it as a funnel, but I think it's much better off if you kind of draw this out here. Because it's much more like a state machine than an actual funnel. So at the end of the day, what you really want to get to is uh, your, your sort of your regular customers. So basically, everybody starts off um, as being a player. They play the game, they install the game. Now there's kind of two ways you can become a regular customer, right? So the first one is you can put money in the game, and you can be a customer. Uh, and then after that, you end up playing seven days consecutive. The other way you can do it is you can kind of go the other way around. So you, you basically, you're a regular now because you played seven days. And then you put money into the game. So that's how you kind of enter the flow. Now, once you're a regular customer, you're not always a regular customer. So if for some reason you miss a day, you kind of go off into this uh, other pool of being basically non-regular again. We call this being weakened. Um, but if you end up playing seven days again, you can come back into the pool. There's also the, the, uh, the lapse people, too, as well. So if you, you end up not playing at all for 14 days, um, you can kind of fall in this lapse pool. But if you ever come back to the game and become regular again, you can become a regular customer again. So this is really interesting when you view it this way, because when you think about your business, each one of these groups need different things, right? So a player that comes in and gives you money, uh, now you're trying to figure out how to get them to play seven days a week. These guys are obviously playing seven days a week. How do you then convert them? For people that have weakened, you try to build game designs and game systems that are going to bring them back seven days a week. Uh, for people who have lapsed, you're going to try to reactivate them to figure out why they've lapsed and then try to make sure turn them back into customers. So it's really a, like an organic state machine. And it's really important that all the pieces fit together because what you realize when you start kind of digging into this is, um, you know, you're not, the majority of the people kind of go down this path, and then it's pretty easy to cycle people around here. But if you're trying to grow a business, the, really the difference between having more regulars than you had yesterday is really adding up all these other little percentages that you can get throughout this entire funnel. So what, what are the power of regulars? So uh, in, in Marvel, um, over 90% of the monthly revenue now is, is through regulars. Uh, and we're still growing them three years into the game. So three years, uh, oh, year over year, we've continued to have our daily number of regular users continues to rise even three years into the game. They end up having over a 97% loyalty rate, which basically means uh, month over month, they are continuing to coming back. There's actually months that we've had over 100% loyalty rate, which is crazy. We've actually had cohorts that are really old that actually are still continuing to grow regulars. Uh, and the beautiful part of it is they have a really stable ARP mark, <laughs> which is actually <laughs> average revenue per monthly active regular customer. <laughs> so, sorry about that, but ARP mark, very stable, which is great because this is, this, if you're looking to forecast your business, you have, a, you have a, a group of people that never leave and pay you the same amount every month. That's like the, it's the perfect forecasting tool. So when we view this for our business, we really think about, um, how we can service these regulars, and we think about this regularity lens throughout an entire business. Uh, and so we've applied this kind of throughout our entire operations. Uh, so how can technology help? Uh, so I'm not gonna stress this any much, but you just you need a good BI system. Like data is 
the most imperative part of this whole system, you need to have uh, sort of multiple components of it. Um, we can now walk it through them. So the first one that, that we really think is super important is we have this concept at Kabam of a 360 view of the player. So a lot of game companies are only sort of viewing their world from what the player does in the game, and that's not the entire picture, right? So you have in-game data, you have marketing data, you have data from your community, maybe your forms, you have customer service. What you really want to do is view all that and get all that into one spot so you can see sort of the 360 view of, of a player. Uh, at Kabam, uh, so we're not going to go too cheap in the deck, but BigQuery is sort of the center hub of our data. Uh, we put a lot of data into BigQuery. Um, on Marvel, you're looking around one and a half petabytes of data alone on there. It's about two trillion rows. We're ingesting a, you know, three to four billion events a day on just one single game. Uh, and the cool part is you know, we've done table scans where you get you know, a billion rows per second uh, on a query performance. So it's really quite impressive. Uh, then we just hook it up to Tableau. Uh, great thing about Tableau Online, it's sort of no ops as well, just like BigQuery. You can hook it, it integrates right great into BigQuery, and we build our reporting on top of that. The last little piece is, is you know, this is obviously the, you know, the predictive, predictive modeling is, is the thing these days. AI is machine learning. This is really about, you have this great huge data set, learn off of it, train your models, and then start predicting and making predictions about the game. And once you can do that, you can do some just really neat stuff. So what we're going to start talking about is sort of the top of the funnel. So people getting into the game, how do you get more regulars into the game? So any game that is successful is going to end up doing performance marketing. So with performance marketing, you're obviously buying ads on different channels and platforms. They're coming into the game. You're able to do a tribute to them. And then you can calculate sort of your yields, right? So your yields are really based off of how much money you think you're going to get out of this person versus how much you spent to acquire them. The real trick about that is yields are very hard to calculate. So um, often people get fooled. Uh, Marvel is a really interesting example because uh, what we saw, since Marvel is a sort of, in some ways it's a collection game, people, what we would see is we'd have actually these users that would come into the game and they'd spend like crazy until they got all the champions that they wanted and then they'd leave. And just sort of like, if you can think of it like a numbers point of view, you could have a guy that comes in, spends a thousand bucks in a month and leave, well that's actually not your highest LTV user. What you much rather have is someone who spends $100 a month and does so for four or five years. That's the type of users you want to get to. So if you just sort of uh, you know, optimize all your ad spend based off sort of like day one to day seven yields. You can often get fooled about actually who your best users are and you're actually not optimizing well enough for your, for your UA spend. So this kind of brought to this concept that we have at, at Kabam called Autotune. So what we end up doing at Kabam is we have this uh, a system called Autotune where we basically, we buy tons of devs ads and you spend money on them. And then once they get in the game and we've attributed them, we have this machine learning model that can sort of detect reg regularity. And it can do it really efficiently. In fact, it only takes about eight hours of actual time and we actually know if someone's gonna be regular in three months from now. Um, and then what we do is we take that, we feed it back into the machine, we can calculate uh, return on ad spend, we can calculate LTVs based on this thing since we know the retention, we know the art marks. Um, and then we just adjust our bidding. So if we're getting tons of regulars here, we're going to throw more money on here. If we get less, we're going to try less on here. And then we can try, uh, we can optimize all kinds of campaigns. We end up having thousands of campaigns and different creative running at once. And then we just let Autotune optimize it for us. And like I was saying, it's really, really tight. So the, uh, this is sort of a graph of sort of the difference uh, in the score. So we're about 95, 90% uh, correct. Uh, on predicting whether or not somebody's going to be regular within eight hours or not. So it's, it's a really, really um, useful model for us, and it, and it works out really quite well. So the next part in the whole thing is sort of strengthening players, which is really turning players into regulars. So uh, lots of books and topics on this, but it's really about habituation, right? Trying to make people to come back and do something every day. Tons of books on this. Uh, uh, there's lots of different ways to do that, and we can talk about a few of them. So uh, we believe in Kabam strongly that social gameplay is one of the strongest ways to get people to play with each other. Um, a lot of these games are sort of like from a neurochemical point of view, are all dopamine 
type things. When you start adding social, you start adding different types of chemicals, different types of feelings into the game, and you start adding social pressure. And that's why games that like World of Warcraft and such have lasted for so long is because people come there and it's a social event and people can still play with their friends and that's what they want to do. So from a technology point of view, you know, people on the internet aren't always the best. <laughs> so you know, when, you start, when you start adding chat and stuff like that, it's really important that you kind of have a good filtering systems. So uh, as positive as a experience can be, it can also be horribly negative too as well. So it's really important that you try to uh, get that in there. You know, adding group chat is great, and, and self-regulating chats, like alliance chats and stuff like that are also excellent. Uh, and then bridging the gap. If you can get, uh, you know, real-time chat translation in there, you can start doing some really interesting social interactions where you can actually use, you know, territorial enemies that can't communicate with each other to, you know, kind of talk. It's really, really interesting. Oops. Lagging. Um, and then the next one's really alliances. So alliances, at least in our games, have just been incredibly powerful. Um, if you just take the short-term um, retention metrics, it, the second someone gets in alliances, their retention basically triples. So um, we always try to get people into alliances. Finding the right type of alliance for people and stuff is a very hard problem and it's very interesting and you can, and you can get some great uh, work on that. The social pressure mechanism is really strong. So if you build events around uh, cooperation or competitive loops around getting people to do things together, you can get these great just engagement uh, boosts. The funny thing about this though is actually that also the number one indicator of churn prediction is actually when you get kicked out of your alliance. So people who get kicked out of the alliance, you're, we are on that right away to get them into a new alliance as much as possible because that's the number one predictor of churn in our game. And then the next one is kind of what we call uh, putting on a show. So we think, you know, if you build a game that someone can literally play for 24 hours a day, you will probably never have any problems monetizing them. You just want to keep them in the game as long as time. We do not believe, a lot of people believe in this sort of concept of like core, core loop binging and they can binge too much and they get fat and then they don't, they don't want to play the game anymore. Absolutely do not believe that, have no data to prove that. People can, if you give them time to play and they play it, they will play it. Um, it's really about giving people stuff to do. So uh, if you kind of look at like what a week looks like in, in, in the contest of champions, it's all really about layering. So uh, we have about 100 events a week that are planned and, it's, and, it's, and they all sort of feed into each other. So you want to build a system that can kind of like, uh, you can stack them. So you can do a couple of these events that give you rewards that go to the next event, that go to the next event, that work on there. There's different types of events for different types of people. Some people play social events so like the AVE, AVA. Other people play single events like PVP and grinding. Giving all these opportunities for people to play these different experiences is really important. And what we've done is we've done a massive investment in tools, uh, it's our back end called Spark, so that we can basically allow live game designers to tune the game in such a way that this is feasible. And how we do it is, is largely kind of four main, main areas. So the first one's really about targeting. So, uh, Having really strong targeting capabilities in your back end is, is extremely important because what you can do is you obviously got to do split testing so you can make these changes and see how they happen. Um, you can end up cohorting players into different things because you know someone who's played the game for three years versus some guy who comes into a different game, they obviously need to be cohorted in there. You can do geo-targeting. Um, our back end is about 200 dimensions uh, and more actually now than uh, of, of targeting that we can add to. Um, and then you can also do action-based targeting. So someone does something and then it changes how, th how they handle it. The next real strong thing that we, that we really are quite proud of is this concept of flexible economy. So uh, all these games, frankly, are kind of similar. They're all where your money is in all these games is having a real strong metagame system. And a metagame, frankly, is really quite simple at its core. It's always you do something, you do an action, and you get something. So you're always trading one resource for another and there's an action in between that. So if you make that generic enough, uh, you can make your entire economy generic uh, in a way that it's just all you're doing is taking this and doing something and turning it into that. And if you build tools around that so that um, your live ops can actually make new items and make new economies and, and, and sort of shape them, then you can do some real powerful things. Um, 
and you can also measure them too as well. So our abstracted economy ends up building a, basically an operation log for every single action that has an economic value to it. So you have an op log of every single thing that happens and you can measure that, which allows you to do this cool stuff like this. Where you, so if you're looking at like a single currency in the game, you can actually see the flow of currency and where it happens. So you can see in kind of the middle there, we saw you know, this currency was kind of you know, getting kind of high. So what we'll do is a live option will maybe make a sink, which might be like a, an event to try to drain that currency. And that will give you a different currency, which then they can make another following event to drain it. So you can really kind of move your economy around in ways that you can kind of alter player behavior. And then the real port and part about this is, um, you know, anytime you get deep into these sort of data-driven analytics and data-driven systems, you really need a way to manage it all. So um, in the contest of champions, there's about two to 300 megabytes of metadata that people are always sort of handling and managing. And you've got to build tools around uh, how you actually, you know, move the different pieces across different environments, how you QA these, how you actually sort of merge them in and diff them and stuff like that. And if you don't do that, you know, you're, you're probably liable up for a mess. Um, I remember one time in, in Olkaban before we had some of these things, we had, we had built a gotcha box once and we didn't have these tools and it was a gotcha box that opened 5,000 more boxes and it was sort of inception and it was, it was a disaster cleanup. So I can't stress this enough how well you need to have good tools about that stuff. So, and then the last one is uh, really about long-term retention. How do you retain people for a long time? So it's really all about sort of knowing when someone's gonna leave. Um, you can pretty much predict that, like I said, there's some really strong indicators. Getting kicked in alliance is a huge one. Uh, velocity changes of, of how much they play or how much they engage their game always yields pretty accurate results. And then you kind of build, you automate it then, right? So um, you have we have machine learning models that are running all the time, generating fit scores on whether or not someone's gonna churn. If they end up gonna churn, then we'll start sending them what we think they need, they might be missing. You know, maybe they've been playing in the game forever and they just, you know, they haven't got the character they wanted or, they, or they, you know, they're running out of currency, you know, we're gonna try to give them a win back prize. And then if they don't come, we'll take it to the next level automation that we're gonna send them an email, right? If they don't come after that, we'll send them a push message. If they still don't come after that, we can actually automatically put them back into a UA campaign and then try to reactivate them that way. Uh, and then we can use deep linking to actually give them reward through the UA campaign. So having that whole sort of automated system allows to sort of claw back these users that maybe left because of whatever reason, they maybe they didn't have something, it could have been seasonality. Um, I mean, we got Pokemon Go a few years ago, like everyone else did, and they, you know, they kind of came back to us afterwards, but we were able to claw back a lot of people during that, during that time. And like I said, really works. I think we've, we raise, with this, we raise our daily revenues by about three to 5%, uh, which is with the, just with the automated churn. Um, hardest part about a lot of these things is trying to figure out why they left. Um, in, you know, deciding whether or not I'm going to leave or not is pretty easy, but if it's like, why, what do I need to give you to make sure that you come back? Uh, and then with the reactivation campaign, often, uh, you know, when you're doing lots of UA, there is a certain part, uh, you know, amount of spend that is actually way cheaper to actually sort of try to reactivate good users than it is to go get brand new users. So sort of in a conclusion here, really, it's all about sort of trying to avoid the shark fin. Um, Games that can sort of grow and have done this holistic approach and use data to do that can thrive for a very long time. Uh, I'm pretty confident that you know Marvel is going to be a decade game at this point. Um, like I said, we're going in our fourth year. We're still continuing to grow the business and grow our number of regulars. And uh, you know, integrating the t technology around this um, really allows you to just kind of handle the player's lifestyle. So, and like I said, every single piece is important. Uh, if you if you don't do all the pieces, you'll end up, you know, kind of like every day you're like, it's the difference between being like 99.9% of the people you had yesterday or 100.1%. It's just really that close in a lot of cases. And just closing the loop on everything is, is, is the way to do it. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Can we get another round of applause for Jeff? He's our customer.